if you're not in school and you're not working and you feel that you would benefit from the opportunity of participating in the HOPE program, then I encourage you to contact HART, NTA, or the NYS to become a part of the National Service Corps. Prime Minister Andrew Holness's offer still stands. If you're between the ages of 18 and 24, call 1-888-432-7868. Send a text or WhatsApp to 876-438-2422 or browse www.heart-nta.org. It's your favorite magazine program with me, Adrian Atkinson. Welcome. There's a lot in store for you, so please stay with us. I'm not going to go general, no school, no work, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Check this out. Maybe it can help you. There's some other. Are you between 18 and 24? Have you dropped out of school to look for work? Improve your chances by joining the National Service Corps. We will get you trained and certified and give you the start you need. This program has been designed to equip you with the core skills and support to succeed in the world of work. Grab your opportunity now. Apply for the National Service Corps program. Get trained, get certified, get ready for work. For more information, contact the Heart Trust NTA or National Youth Service Office. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Monday, August 13. Jamaica is to benefit from increased technical support in the utilization of nuclear technology for development purposes. This is being facilitated under a new five-year country program framework signed with the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. The new country program, which is applicable for the period 2018 to 2023, will focus on water and environment management, health and nutrition, food and agriculture, nuclear and radiation safety and security, and energy and industry. This is the second cooperation program in Jamaica, with the first covering the period 2010 to 2015. The International Atomic Energy Agency has provided nearly 3 million euros in funding support for projects that have either been completed or are currently underway. The PIOJ serves as the National Liaison Office for the program. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett is reviewing the policy governing the use of the Black River for safari tours. The review is to determine whether the current moratorium allows for optimum carrying capacity in operations. Minister Bartlett says based on consultation with stakeholders, the goal is to create an arrangement that will foster orderly conduct among all tour operators and ensure full compliance with licensing regulations. The popular Black River Safari Tours have been in operation for close to 30 years and attract many tourists annually. It is a guided motor launch tour lasting approximately one and a half hours, starting from the town of Black River and going up into the Black River Lower Morass, Jamaica's largest wetland area. Minister Bartlett was speaking during a recent site visit at one of the safari tours in the parish. More than 3,500 young people across the island are getting training and employment opportunities through the Ministry of Local Government and Community Development. They are the second batch to benefit from the ministry's Youth Summer Employment Program, which started last year and benefited approximately 2,000 participants. This year, the program is increasing the number of beneficiaries and adding a two-week extension, so the youth will be employed for six weeks starting today. Not only have we increased the numbers, but this year, we will have some unique features to the program. This year, we have included disaster risk management as a core function of the Youth Summer Employment Program. 
the best 150 young persons from the Disaster Response Corps will be retained until the end of the calendar year to collect data on disaster risks across the country. To input the data that will be collected, we're going to be identifying another 50 of you who are computer savvy. You will be retained within the municipal cooperations to help to input the data that will be collected based on the survey. Among other things, the young people will also assist in property tax and trade license management. Minister of Justice Delroy Chuck says construction work on the Court of Appeal building in downtown Kingston is well within the $845 million budget and is on track for completion before the start of the new court term in September. The expansion is part of the ministry's commitment to improve the built environment for the justice sector. I think we're still on target. What you see is some significant work that has taken place since April the 15th. The major deliverables to come will be the elevators, and I understand the two elevators are on their way. They should be delivered on the August the 25th. It will take less than a week to install them because all the preliminary work is being done. The minister was speaking following a tour of the building last week Thursday. In April, he signed a contract to undertake the project, which will see the addition of three new courtrooms, 14 judges' chambers, and two lounges. The project is set to pave the way for the expansion of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. And finally, Prime Minister Andrew Holness has suspended the policy that prohibits women wearing sleeveless attire from entering government buildings. The Prime Minister has also given instructions for a full review of government dress code practices. It is in keeping with a commitment previously given by the Prime Minister to review the long-standing practice. A statement from the Office of the Prime Minister says that review found that there is no law or official government policy on which this no-sleeveless dress code restriction is based. It further adds that Cabinet has taken note of the concerns expressed by members of the public and empathizes with the unfortunate experiences shared primarily by women in both extreme and everyday circumstances. The Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport has been mandated to formulate a government dress code policy that is aligned with modern considerations as well as the climatic realities of Jamaica. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Make diseases spread, wash your hands with soap and water instead. Wash them regular or use a hand sanitizer, make sure the germs them dead. Touching your eyes or your mouth or your nose, wash your hands before you do things like those. After you use the bathroom before preparing food, come on, wash your hands them clean. We're three weeks away from the official start of the new school year and with it many firsts for our children. First day of infant school, primary school, high school, sixth form and university. This next feature focuses on one of these firsts. Take a look. We've all been there. As our academic careers unfold, we have many transitions. From basic school, then to primary school, and then to high school. College is usually the next step, but wait. There's another shorter transition between those main high school years and the university campus. Sixth form is considered as that transition period. It is a period within which the students are moving from a kind of a school feeding type of education to one where they now have to do more critical thinking, they have to do uh, additional research and they have to uh, pretty much function at a different level as they prepare themselves for the next stage in their education. Students are actually exiting secondary level at a younger age, uh, some at age 15, some at age 16. And in accordance with our regulation, there would be two additional years that they should really be um, within the school system. And so the sixth form program provides those two additional years for the students to develop the level of maturity that is required for them to move on to tertiary level institutions or for them to move into the world of work. But apart from developing your maturity, 
Sixth form is where you prepare to sit those critical CAPE subjects. After sixth form, I would like to go to the UA Mona to study medicine and you will require escape, so that is why I really want to do CAPE. And before you even get to university, the CAPE program will allow you to develop critical thinking and leadership skills because you're most likely to be selected to be student leaders for the lower school. I was a prefect at the Edwin Hallin High School and from the CAPE program I've learned leadership skills and along with being a prefect, I've learned to be on time, punctual actually, right? I've learned to be punctual. And along with that, I've been a peer council coordinator. I've been the project manager for the key club. It is very important that as students are being prepared to become adults, that they are fully rounded in different areas. And the academics, while it is extremely important, it is also very important that they are involved in some kind of cultural or socially related activities, uh, sports included, for their uh, development. Well, I was attending the Portman Community College. I was involved in female football team trailing as well as drama. But doing these extracurricular activities, I was nervous, I didn't know how to manage my time. But as time goes by, I know also do uh, the most important stuff first. But despite the various opportunities that you can receive from the sixth form program, the transition can be difficult to navigate at first. Well, I'm extremely nervous about sixth form. Um, I know that I have to put in extra work because it's not that easy as CXC, as everyone is saying. Um, but I'm kind of looking forward to it. So if you're like Gabriel and you're feeling the nerves, fret not, you have nothing to worry about. Now sixth form is sometimes seen as a status symbol. So if you're in sixth form, it simply means that you would have done exceptionally well. So it is a time when our students should settle down they should relax and they should work as hard as they possibly can. For those who are nervous and don't know what to expect, overall I would say that CAPE is actually a very good program. It prepares you for university and it prepares you for life on a whole. After doing our six, I would say try it. It's very exciting. It's new. It will take you to the next step of your career because you know most universities require CAPE. So it's, it's, it's very good. I enjoyed it. If the sixth form program is what awaits you this September, Embrace the opportunities it has to offer. All you have to do is have an open mind. Work hard, get involved, and manage your time well. All the best. This is Romain Virgo. I'm your appeal to all of the youths them to just stay away from crime and violence. We know the temptation, the money, the fast life, people say them rate you, but I will only take you nowhere. If you stay in school and focus, then you can achieve anything. Be your own leader. A gang is a dead end. A message from the Ministry of National Security. As we lead up to the start of the new school year, let's look now at how the Health Ministry is securing the young among us. Immunization is arguably one of the most cost-effective healthcare interventions ever invented. Since the first successful vaccine was developed to treat smallpox in 1796, vaccination has been preventing illnesses and deaths for millions of people around the world. According to the World Health Organization, about 2 to 3 million deaths are prevented each year because of persons taking up vaccines or being immunized. Through vaccination, smallpox was declared eradicated from the world in 1980, and that's a significant achievement. Other diseases are on the verge of being eradicated through the process of immunization here in Jamaica. Immunization has led to a substantial reduction of illnesses and death from diseases such as polio, measles, uh, whooping cough, and newborn tetanus. Measles deaths have decreased by almost 80% uh, over the past 10 years, which again is uh, a significant achievement. 
Jamaica's immunization program has managed to eliminate a number of vaccine-preventable diseases over the years. These include polio, which usually left children paralyzed. Jamaica had the last case, for example, of polio in 1982. The last case of locally transmitted measles in 1991. The last case of diphtheria in 1995. The last case of rubella in 2000 and the last case of newborn tetanus in 2001. In 2011, the country recorded 100% immunization coverage for BCG or tuberculosis. Thanks to the expanded program on immunization, EPI, which began in 1976, the population coverage against vaccine-preventable diseases remains relatively high. Under the program, immunization coverage for children under 2 years old reached 93 to 94 percent in 2010-2011. The expanded program on immunization provides free vaccination to children ages 0 to 7 during the routine immunization schedule of the Ministry of Health. This is an integral strategy to reduce child mortality and morbidity. First, we give at birth up to six weeks of age BCG vaccine, which is given usually in the hospital setting, and BCG protects against tuberculosis. At six weeks, three months, and six months, Babies are due a vaccine against polio, which prevents poliomyelitis, as well as the pentavalent vaccine or the five-in-one vaccine. Then at 12 months of age, the MMR vaccine is administered to protect children against measles, mumps, and rubella. At 18 months, we give the first set of booster vaccines, and we give boosters again for MMR, the children get DPT as well, which is for diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. And then they also get the polio vaccine at that time as well. Between the ages of four to six years, children must get a second booster vaccine for DPT, as well as a second booster vaccine for polio. A lot of these vaccine preventable diseases are actually quite contagious and can cause death, especially among our young children. And so therefore, I would encourage parents to ensure that their children are appropriately vaccinated. In Jamaica, children must be fully immunized before entry to school. And that is usually a part of mandatory school medicals due before the start of each academic year. They have to present the immunization record at the health facility to confirm that the vaccines indeed have been done. And if they are missing any vaccines for whatever reason, then they are provided for them at the health facility. The immunization record is part of the Child Health Development Passport introduced for every child in 2010 to replace the immunization cards used previously. As part of its public education initiative, the Ministry of Health displays posters and other material at health centers and schools, reminding parents and caregivers about the immunization schedules, showing what vaccine is due and when. Disease surveillance is also practiced at ports of entry to combat the country's increased susceptibility to new diseases due to globalization and increased travel. Across the board, government is on a mission to improve the health of the nation by making traditional vaccines available and exploring new and non-traditional vaccines to tackle other diseases. For example, the mitigation of NCDs like some cancers which can be prevented through vaccinations such as the vaccine for the human papilloma virus, which causes cervical cancer, falls in, the line, in line with the Ministry of Health strategic plan to improve the offering to the public. And the commitment today is that we will work to ensure that other vaccines on the market with a proven track record are introduced as part of our routine administration to our population. I love my children and I will do anything to protect them. So that's why as a mom and as a doctor, I made sure that my daughter got the HPV vaccine to protect her from cervical cancer later in life when she becomes a woman. The HPV vaccine is very safe and effective. I was afraid of the injection at first, but I got it and it really wasn't that bad after all. If there was something you could do to protect your child, wouldn't you do it? Protect our next generation. 
Ensure that your daughter gets the HPV vaccine today. Don't wait. Vaccinate against cervical cancer. A message from the Ministry of Health. You've just watched a testimonial. Now take a look at the wider government program to protect our girls from the human papillomavirus. Globally, cervical cancer is the second most common type of cancer in women with over 85% occurring in developing countries. Every year, 528,000 new cases are diagnosed and there are approximately 270,000 deaths. By 2050, without any intervention, the number of diagnosed cases of cervical cancer is expected to increase to 1 million per year, with approximately 90% of the deaths occurring in developing countries like ours. A major factor is the human papillova virus, HPV, of which there are approximately 200 types that infect epithelia, or skin tissue. At least 14 types of the human papilloma virus have been found to cause cancer of the cervix. Types 16 and 18 are responsible for 70% of cancers of the cervix, which is a second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in Jamaica. The virus can be transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact, from mother to child at birth. Current estimates indicate that every year, just under 400 women are diagnosed with this disease, with approximately 185 dying from the disease, with the majority of deaths occurring in women between the ages of 40 and 64 years of age. A prevalence study conducted in Jamaica in 2010 revealed that the overall prevalence of any type of HPV infection was 54%. Cancer-causing HPV types were detected in 34.9% of the women, and HPV types 16 and 18 were found in 10.5% of the general population and in 71% of women with abnormal pap smears. This reality has prompted the Jamaican government to take the initiative to prevent cervical cancer through the introduction of the bivalent human papilloma virus HPV vaccine. The World Health Organization, WHO, recommends that HPV vaccines be included in national immunization programs as a core strategy for primary prevention against cervical cancer. WHO states, Mr. Speaker, that HPV vaccination for girls ages 9 to 14 years is the most cost-effective public health measure against this disease. More than 70 countries around the world including more than 20 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, have already introduced the vaccine. Several studies and monitoring by the World Health Organization, WHO Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, proved that HPV vaccination is safe and works extremely well, decreasing the number of HPV infections and related precancers. The bivalent HPV vaccine introduced by the Ministry of Health in schools at grade 7 to girls ages 9 to 14 provides for 90 to 100 percent protection against HPV types 16 and 18. The vaccine is offered free of cost. Bear in mind too, by the way, that the cost to administer one of these vaccines, for us, the cost is somewhere in the region of 7, 8 US dollars. If you go into the private sector, you're looking at anywhere from eleven dollars to $15,000. So it's not inexpensive. This vaccine is not mandatory, and beneficiaries received opt-out forms for parents and guardians to give or refuse permission for their girl child to receive the vaccine. We can take it that the indication, if anything, is that they want this, they identify with this, 
I remember one girl indicated that her mother actually called her aunt, who is a nurse, for advice. So that spells good. It says that persons are prepared to consult, get information, and then make informed decisions. And so that is going well. Approximately 22,500 girls were targeted for the vaccine's introduction in 2017, with each girl needing two doses given six months apart for full protection. Generally speaking, the process has gone smoothly. The school-based strategy for implementation seeks to facilitate greater access to the targeted population. This covers the cost for social mobilization and communication, cold chain equipment, training and sensitization, and procurement of vaccine and vaccination supplies. And this disease prevention strategy will save the government millions. The Ministry of Health estimated that annual cost for the program after introduction will be 73.3 million Jamaican dollars. In Jamaica, the estimated cost is of, of the just under 400 cases annually, Mr. Speaker, is some $274 million. I should point out that this figure is only for radiotherapy and does not include diagnosis and chemotherapy. And for the individual, not just the emotional and physical trauma caused by this cancer is removed, but the financial burden. In the United States, cost on diagnosis is approximately some 15, 15,000, just under 16,000 US dollars. If the patient survives for a year, this right goes up to approximately 30,000 US dollars. Despite vaccination, persons will still need to do their routine pap smear to check for any threat or signs of the cancer, as the key to effective treatment, if it should occur, is early detection. For more information or to have your concerns answered, you can call the Ministry of Health's toll-free line 1-888 one love or 1-888-663-5683 also email hpvinfo at moh.gov.jm you can also visit the website moh.gov.jm as well as social media channels And that's where we close things off, but only for today. We return round about the same time tomorrow right here on the station. We're available online 24-7, 365. Visit jis.gov.jm, our pages on all the social media platforms, and download our mobile app from your respective play stores. On behalf of the entire team here at the JIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. See you next time. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.